Good evening, everybody. Hi, Kurt. Can you hear me? Yes, Michael, I can hear you. Excellent. excellent. I hope they got rid of the gremlins that we saw earlier, but otherwise, I, I'm fine. I hope so, but if that's the case, you just shared that with everybody watching. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Rob, and in particular, Marla, for that uh, fascinating interview earlier. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to continue with this theme of interviews uh, on Yom Show by uh, being in conversation with Kurt Marx, who came to the UK uh, on a kinder transport uh, from Cologne. Uh, we heard earlier about the story of the kinder transport, and this is an opportunity to hear a bit more about uh, an individual person's journey. So, Kurt, I'll just do a quick introduction of you. Um, because you were born in 1925 uh, in Cologne and then came to the UK in January 1939 on one of the kinder transports organized by Eric Klebanski, the headmaster of the Yavna school, the Jewish school in Cologne. Uh, and if we ask nicely enough, uh, there should be a picture of a class photograph that we can put up. I don't know if you can see it there. Yes, I can see it. It was the earlier picture. That wasn't in the Klebanski school, but it was in the other Jewish primary school. Uh -huh. I'm somewhere in the bottom. I think I'm the fourth from the right sitting down. Fourth from showing the right. Us, showing us your fifth, knees. Fifth from the right. And can you, can you just describe your early childhood in, Col in Cologne? that part of your life? Well, we lived a happy, normal, I suppose, yes, it was normal. It was before the Hitler period. And uh, life was like a young child's life, presumably. I was fairly carefree. I had no problems. And I had a large family in Cologne, where every part of the town was known to me. I had an uncle here, an uncle there. One was a dentist, one was a butcher. My grandmother lived across the river. We had a large family, and I was a happy little boy. And were you aware, of, you were only eight or so when the Nazis took power in uh, 1933, were you aware in the, in the atmosphere uh, about the rise of the Nazis or the risk? Well, of the... I was 1933. I was, how old was I? I was seven, eight years old. I had lots of friends and suddenly some of these friends, somehow or other, they didn't want me anymore. They didn't like me anymore. I couldn't understand it, but of course it was, they had joined Hitler movement, Hitler youth, and I was a, Jew and a Jew at that time was not something that non-Jewish children would want have anything to do with. I went to the local school and after a little while all Jewish children were not allowed to go there anymore. Fortunately in Cologne we had a very large Jewish school so I went as a little boy, I think I was six, probably six or seven. I was transferred from one to the other. As a small boy, you don't understand what is happening. But instead of having non-Jewish friends, I had Jewish friends. And it didn't really make any difference to me. Um, and were you, you aware of the rising anti-Semitism, the restrictions, the impact of the Nuremberg laws in the mid-1930s, for example? Well, that, that of course affected us. We were not we were not socializing with non-Jewish children. That was the first thing. We were not allowed to do a variety of things. You couldn't go to the cinema anymore. Not that I went to the cinema. But I wasn't allowed. If you went to, I was learning how to swim. And when we got, my mother used to take me to this indoor pool. So that's very nice pool. And um, there was a big notice, no Jews, Jews not allowed. So I didn't know why, why can't I go swimming anymore, but that's how it was. Yeah. They couldn't go to restaurants, hotels, whatever 
the whole public life changed and Jews became second class citizens and lots of prohibitions in all directions. And then we move uh, through the 1930s, culminating, of course, with the uh, Kristallnacht in uh, November 1938. So you would have been 13 at the time. You, you just had your bar mitzvah, Correct. I think, uh, yes. in the Runstrasse and yes. uh, synagogue. And then describe what happened well, I, with, I, of I the normally, Sorry. Normally I would go to school. I had a bicycle. That was I was a free spirit. I could go anywhere and visit anybody in town. I went to school on my bicycle, as usual, on the 9th of November. Everything was, seemed fairly normal. The corner of our street, there was a, a shop. It had been, a, I remember, it was a toy shop. And this toy shop that was there for, even after the war, it was still there. And I saw that one of the big plate glass windows had been broken. So I thought there must have been an accident didn't take too much notice of it. I go to, went to school, which was about a half an hour cycle ride. And um, school was a commotion outside. There was smoke coming out of there. There were lots of people milling around. There were teachers in front of the school. And when we got there, he says, there's no school today. You better go home. We'll let you know what's happening. Didn't seem to make much sense. I couldn't see any fire there. Later on, I discovered we had a small synagogue attached to our school. It was the Yavne in Cologne. It was a secondary school. And the synagogue had been set alight during that night, but that we did find out later. So I decided, well, day off school is not such a bad thing. And I said, I'll go and visit my uncle, who was not very far from there. He had a butcher shop. And uh, usually when I went there, my aunt would give me a piece of sausage and a cucumber because she thought I was not getting enough to eat at home. And uh, when I got to the shop, it was smashed to smithereens. It was in little pieces. It was, had marble slabs and everything was smashed up. It, uh, and suddenly, well, not so sudden, so that something can't be right. No school, smoke, my uncle's shop smashed up. So I didn't have a mobile phone in those days. Uh, couldn't phone to find out what's, what's happening at home. So I got on my bike and got home. I was there half an hour later. When I got home, my father wasn't at home. Mother was there. Where's father? Well, he apparently had been told by a friend the night before don't stay at home tonight, there's going to be trouble. It was all prearranged. It had it was supposed to be spontaneous. It was an arranged business by the Nazis to literally destroy Jewish life. That's where when it really got going. People lost their business, lost their jobs. The teachers who used to teach weren't allowed to teach in non-Jewish schools. So the whole life for the Jewish community became very, very difficult. And then you, you, aware, you became aware fairly quickly about the opportunity to go to England. I mean, one no, of the things, one of the things just, just to give a bit of context, one of the things that happened in reaction to the Kristallnacht was a debate in British Parliament that then led to the creation of the Kinder Transport. But That's correct. The, the speed at which the various authorities, both in Germany and Austria and then in Britain, made arrangements, logistical arrangements, bearing in mind the first kinder transport then came to England just less than a month after the Kristallnacht. Uh, well, I was lucky. I went to the Yavne. As you mentioned earlier on, our headmaster, the director of our school, was Erich, Dr. Erich Klebanski very forward-looking man and he decided he said but we cannot live in germany anymore and he said he tried anyway to transfer the whole school to england 
Mm. We were lucky. We were the first ones, the first group of children, with 20 boys and 20 girls. And he managed to arrange us to join Kinder Transport. And we were supported by the Cricklewood Synagogue, the Warm Lane Synagogue, whose rabbi was Rabbi Rabinowitz, a very fine man. And within, well, this was November 1938, he had to firstly persuade the parents to allow their children to go because many people didn't want their children to leave. They said, no, our children remain with us. We stay together. So he had to persuade the parents to let us go and then organize our coming to England. And I was lucky. My parents decided, yes, and we, I would be allowed to come here. We've, we've got a, a picture of your uh, visa to allow oh, you yes. to come into uh, yes. Right. to Britain but can you can you then just because because the next picture is from you in the hostel in London yeah. which we'll talk about in just a moment but can you describe that uh, that memory of departure that that moment which came when you left your parents so, Klebanski had arranged with some of the parents to allow us to come here he arranged it between, as I said, the 9th of November. We left uh, Cologne at the beginning of January. I mean, it's amazing how he organized all this. Uh, yes, we, we weren't, the boys were not unhappy about going. We, we didn't, at that stage, we thought, well, we will go to England, which is a foreign country, it's very exciting. And our parents, many of our parents had already tried to emigrate from Germany, which was not so easy. My parents were going to America. They had a visa or they had a, a certificate to go, but it had a time, the time wasn't ready yet and they had to wait for their number to be called. Mm. So they assumed in a few months time they would be going to America and I would then join them to go to the, to America. One or two of the boys, in fact, this has actually happened. Mm -hmm. They came to London, they came to the hostel. This was the picture of the boys in Minster Road in Cricklewood. Our girls were in Wilson Lane. Uh, I stand in front of the, uh, the gentleman who was holding on to me, I don't know why. But anyway, he was the one of the young rabbis in Cologne. He was our teacher, our Latin teacher, history teacher, very clever man, but not and, so good with children. And we should uh, we should just explain that this was the uh, hostel for the boys, obviously, but the yes. you said the sister hostel was the one in Wilsden Lane, and many of the people listening might have come across the book and the play, the one-person play, the children of Wilsden Lane, the pianist right. of Wilsden Lane, which yes. of course is performed today by Mona Golubek, uh, whose That's mother right. Lisa Eura yes, was the daughter of Lisa Eura. Well, I remember Lisa. We, we this was during the war. I had before before war broke out. We were evac. We went to a local school in Kilburn, and we were evacuated away from London before war broke out. Right. So we hadn't been in the hostel so very long before. We were sent away again. And this was a more difficult situation because suddenly whereas in the hostel we were 20 boys together. We knew each other, so we were, we, we were good friends and suddenly we were evacuated away from London. By that time, we, our English was already passable, I suppose. And we were evacuated to Bedford. Uh -huh. We were marched through Bedford at the time and we arrived with thousands of other kids from, Lon from London schools and marched through the town and people, teachers knocked on doors and they says, how many of these will you take? And we were two, of, well, they, they took the girls first for some reason or other. And the boys were picked later and a friend of mine and I, we were picked by this 
couple, a middle-aged couple, very kind. And they took strange children and had no idea where they came from or who they were and took them into their homes, which was an incredible thing to happen. And I lived with them for quite a number of years. Yeah. And, and during that time that you were there with them, were you in touch with other of the kinder who'd come with you to England or, or others you'd met? Well, we were, as I said, we were evacuated to Bedford. And the Jewish community in Cricklewood had arranged for a sort of guardian for us to come to Bedford as well. So we had an anchor there. We had somewhere to go to. Uh, and they tried to look after us. We didn't, we got to know them. We didn't know them at the time. Yeah. So at least we had a Mr. and Mrs. Harris who were, who ran the, what is called the center in Bedford. And all kinds of Jewish children who had been evacuated used to come there and be, used to meet each other. And were, and were you at the same time getting any correspondence from your parents back in Cologne? Well, this was, of course, one of the big problems in the early days, the hostel days. Boys don't seem to communicate so much. We were forced once a week to sit down and write a letter home. And uh, some of the boys were very, very homesick. And they wrote horrendous stories and the parents were terribly worried and would get a letter and said, did you, you get enough to eat? Do your clothes fit you? Are you all right? Are you warm enough? All questions that a mother would ask of a child, but we were, we children are very resilient. They cope with things. And as I said, they only heard from other parents how terrible things were for, for their children. Mm -hmm. But most of us were quite able to cope with our life as it was. Because we knew it won't be long, we'll be going. It was like a, a it seemed like a holiday in the first instance. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it wasn't in the end. Now, um... And we need to jump a little bit here, but just because we're coming, we're also commemorating the 75th anniversary of the liberation this year, but it's also a big milestone anniversary for the end of the war, VE Day is coming. Right. Do you have uh, any memories of VE Day, 8th of May, 1945? Where were you? What were your feelings? Where was I? VE Day, well, I had put it this way. Uh, we went to school in Bedford. Uh, schooling, of course, was compulsory. So we had still one year of schooling here. And when I was 15, we were all 50, most of us, we were told, yes, now you're 15 and now you go to work because if you want to eat, you have to work. So uh, we, we did all various kinds of jobs and eventually we all sort of settled down one way or another some were successful some were very successful it's quite amazing how many of the boys did reasonably or did rather very well and um i was still in bedford during the blitz and once the blitz was over the firm i worked for relocated back to london and i came back to london and then my first place where I lived at that time was the hostel in Wilson Lane, which had been the girls' hostel, which had been maintained by the uh, Jewish community. And that's where I met Lisa Jura, who was a very good pianist. We used, used to enjoy listening to her. But uh, she was working in a factory making uniforms. But the lady who ran the hostel persuaded her to try to get a scholarship to go to the Royal Academy of Music. Yes. And she practiced and she actually, I was there at the time and the letter came from the Royal Academy and she had been accepted, which was great uh, joy for everybody. 
I know I'm conscious of the, the time here. If we can, I can ask the um, chaps there to put up the fourth picture, oh, which is yeah. of the commemoration. And just to preface this, of course, in Britain, we talk about the uh, honoring the survivors and the refugees who obviously had very different stories. Yes, something, yes, which, yes. something which links them, of course, is that sometimes the parents of the refugees or the kinder were themselves in deported in concentration camps or deported yes. to their deaths in the east. So can you just describe what uh, is... you are here? No, I was, war was over. There was no trace of my parents, but there was only but no way of knowing what had happened to them. They had been deported. That was discovered, but we didn't know where or when or what. In fact, my father wrote a Red Cross message to me on the 19th of July, 1942, where he writes, we are just leaving. Remember, don't forget us, something like that. And that was the last message I had. And I never saw them again. And eventually it took 50 years before I discovered that had been deported and sent to this place, Mali Trostenets near Minsk. Nobody has ever heard of Mali Trostenets. And Mali Trostenets was the an extermination camp. It wasn't a concentration camp. It wasn't the work camp. It was a con, uh, uh, con, uh, an extermination camp. They were sent on the 19th or the 20th of July. They were, they left Cologne, arrived in Mali Trostenets or in Minsk three days later. They were taken to Mali Trostenets to, to a, a wood called Blagovchina, which nobody's ever heard of. And they were murdered immediately. Well, I think Just, it, uh, I think it's, particularly important because people would have heard of places like Auschwitz and of course in this context Bergen-Belsen but it's critical to remember that there was a whole network of places of death extermination centers deportation destinations across East Europe sometimes people have never heard of but places like this exist and it, looking again at the, the photograph that there are memorials there and I think yes. that's a that's an important aspect to remember as well. And in this particular place at that time, the mayor of Cologne was there for this yes. commemoration when they opened up this remembrance park, I suppose, where something one doesn't know between anything up to a quarter of a million people were murdered. Mostly or many from Cologne. In fact, there was only one train load from Cologne, which my parents were on. And strangely enough, Klebanski and his family were on that same train as my parents. Lots of young children. Yeah. That's another thing to, to note as well, that Klebanski, having saved the children and made arrangements for them to come to London, he himself was then deported and murdered. Right. Yeah. And this is the tragedy that eventually, strangely enough, it, it is, it, life is full of coincidences. My mother's two sisters who had lived in Dusseldorf, which is not so far from Cologne, had also been deported to Bali Trostenitz. This I only discovered fairly recently. And my father-in-law, whom I had never met, obviously. He was also sent from Hamburg to the same place. It is and a place that one has never heard of. And yeah. In fact, five members of my family, or possibly the husband as well, I wasn't sure of my uncle and aunt. We haven't got any record of that. So, and until fairly recently, there was no, I remember the first time when I discovered all this, I'd made my business to go there because I felt I have to say Kaddish somewhere. And I found the place where they had lost their lives. Um, I, should, 
I just want to uh, bring up one final photograph here because uh, oh. here, here you've got uh, somebody famous meeting Prince Charles, I think that is. Yes. I think that is somebody famous with Prince Charles, yes. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, this, I, I included that. I wanted to include that here, not only because we heard the message earlier from Prince Charles, yes. uh, but also because his patronage of organisations that work in commemoration of the Holocaust, uh, and he's been a big supporter also of the AJR and the Kinder Transport re reunions. Um, but I think it says something also about how the uh, this is framed in the public consciousness, the story of the kind of transport. But you, you have a fun, you have a memory of that that encounter with with the prince. Yes, I. He became the patron of Kinder Transport, and I I had a video which was made years ago by the German television company, which was called "The Forgotten Children of Cologne," which is more or less our story, my story. And I had this DVD and I asked, how is it, could I give it to him? And I asked any number of people and said, oh no, there's protocol and you can't give him anything that isn't, that isn't done. Anyway, I, I took it along with me, put it in my pocket. And as it happens, this was pure coincidence, he happened to sit down next to me at, this was in St. James's Palace. And I asked him, Is it, am I allowed to give you a present? He says, of course you are. So I took this envelope and I told him what it was and I gave it to him. And that just, you see this blue envelope with my DVD that I gave to him. And uh, within yeah. a week, I had a letter from his secretary thanking me for the present that I had given him. And I, I really treasure this because it is really something they do know how to behave or how, how to handle things. I have a great regard for him. I think he is yeah. really a wonderful man. Well, um, as my uncle would say, it was, it's an honor for him to meet you. Um, <laughs> I think we need to wrap up here, but I will just end by not only thanking you, but also uh, letting people know that if they want to see more of your story, you have, of course, given an interview to the AJR for our Refugee Voices archive. And you can visit that archive at uh, www.ajrrefugeevoices.org.uk. Uh, and there are 250 other interviews as part of that collection, including a resource that we've made for this year for Bergen Belsen to capture the extracts from survivors from the camp. But with that, I just want to thank you very much, Kurt, for everything you do. Of course, you do go back to schools in Germany to talk about your experiences as well. Uh, and we are very grateful for everything you do to perpetuate the memory of the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you for asking me.